Welcome everybody to today's phone call. I'm glad to see that uh, there's still quite a number of substantial audiences by the fact that they established between Bolivians and Bolivians. Uh, we are having a talk today by Carl Fernand, who's been with the NPIA since the beginning of this year, working in Alliance Group. And uh, as you saw from the title and the abstract, is all about extremes today. Carl's uh, guest is also going to present the, the, the instrument to uh, um, results. Yes. Yeah, so, please. Great. Well, thank you all for, for coming and, and choosing not to take a long weekend. <laughs> Appreciate it very much. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about extreme science, uh, submillimeter instrumentation and the study of far kind of fine structure emission lines in early galaxies. And this work really is uh, basically what my thesis work is, and it will be kind of split between uh, motivation for why we want to build the instrument that we did, a little bit of the science, and then a little bit of the instrument. Uh, and likely, before I before I go on to other other places, I will probably likely give another talk at some time more on the on the science and, and talk in detail. But uh, this is also a little bit of an advertisement for the instrument because we always like uh, get people excited who might also maybe want to use it. Um, so there's been a lot of people involved in this work. Uh, I was uh, in my PhD just finished up at Cornell University working with Gordon Stacy. Uh, and there, this is a core group of people that, at Cornell. We have a lot of undergrads involved with this, but then there's been a lot of other folks at uh, National Institute of Standards Technology, University of Columbia, and then a whole bunch of other folks, including uh, collaborators up at uh, up in Bonn, uh, Ralph Gustin, Carl Menten, and Oxford Weiss, who let us use their telescope. Uh, a lot of people involved with the course, and you're probably wondering, uh, how is my science extreme? Well, I, as in the, in the abstract, it's extreme because we make use of extreme locations, extreme technologies, um, and extreme emission lines to try and understand extreme galaxies. Um, and so basically, that is what we're gonna, I'm going to be talking about, and I'll hopefully convince you that all these things are extreme. Uh, I'll start with a little history of a, in the motivation as to what these extreme galaxies are. Um, how we can study them using the extreme emission lines, specifically the far infrared fine structure lines, things like C plus, 158 micron line. Uh, our initial work with the first generation Zeus instrument, Zeus 1. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what I think the potential in the future is for these lines and how we might go about realizing them, uh, which will depend a lot on some extreme technology, which is Zeus 2. Uh, and then lastly, uh, some extreme locations, talking about our commissioning of Zeus 2 at the So. Extreme galaxies, uh, and I think the story of extreme galaxies really starts back in 1983, which uh, I think was a pretty good year for astronomy because Carl Frickenhoff was born. Uh, but also the infrared uh, astronomical satellite was launched, which performed the first all-sky survey in infrared wavelengths. Uh, and they found the sample of ultra-luminous infrared galaxies. And at the time, nobody really knew what they were. There was some thought that in the, when, in the initial discoveries that they were so bright uh, that maybe they were a nearby object, perhaps like Planet X or something out in the, in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, but they actually ended up to be um, these really bright infrared galaxies. So if I'm talking extreme and ultra-luminous, what first is a normal galaxy? Well, of course, that prototypical one might be the Milky Way, uh, where you're forming something on order of one star or two stars per year, or you know, one or two solar masses of stars per year on average has the mass of 1 times 10 to 12 uh, solar masses, and the luminosity in the range of 10 to 10 uh, solar luminosities. OK, how about on the other extreme then? Uh, there we have ultra-luminous infrared galaxies. Um, and the term, in this case, is really just a luminosity class. So it's really anything above 10 to 12 solar luminosities. If you see something that's 10 to 11, folks will use LURBS, uh, just luminous infrared galaxies. And sometimes, if you get above 10 to 13, you'll see hyperluminous infrared galaxies. Um, the other important uh, characterization is the visible light in these galaxies is less than the optical, or excuse me, less than the infrared light. So most of this energy, most of this luminosity needs to be coming out in the infrared. And locally, at least, they seem to be uh, you know, mergers that powers an intense nuclear starburst, and in some cases, an active galactic nuclear. The prototypical one of these is ARC-220, where it's this is forming on the order of 200 some solar masses per year, and of course has a luminous uh, infrared luminosity of 10 to 12. If you look at their SEDs, of course, they look, can look very different. So as you go from a normal galaxy, the optical emission is uh, strongest. 
Uh, but as you go to the infrared, uh, ultra-luminous infrared galaxy, it's, it's peaking in the infrared, which is, of course, just saying these have a lot of dust that's reprocessing the optical stellar light and UV light into the infrared. So the next step in, in these extreme galaxies and our understanding of them comes with, in the early 90s with COBE, the Cosmic Microwave uh, Cosmic Background Explorer, which its goal, of course, was to study the CMB, but it also made some important discoveries on uh, the infrared backgrounds. Specifically, it discovered this surprisingly large uh, cosmic infrared background. Based off all the known uh, infrared sources prior to this, including uh, the ultra-luminous infrared galaxies, um, you know, they had some estimate for what the cosmic microwave background was, and what Kobe actually saw was some uh, infrared background that was uh, comparable to the actual optical background. Um, so this is the optical background, this is the infrared, uh, and they're actually comparable in size. This is quite shocking because this suggested that local galaxies couldn't account for this infrared background. The only way to account for it would be unseen high redshift galaxies, but you wouldn't expect those to be dusty. They shouldn't have a lot of metals. They shouldn't be evolved yet. But in fact, they must be. They must be dusty. Uh, the next step in trying to understand this in this infrared background comes to the late 90s, where we have the first large scale uh, Submillimeter surveys have with specifically with SCUBA and the JCMT at 450-850 microns, and this is where they first started to resolve out what this cosmic infrared background really was. And they identified this population of submillimeter bright galaxies, which if you go shift it from the the observed frame at submillimeter into rest frame, that becomes the uh, far infrared. And so they're now saying, hey, we have this population of really bright, highly star forming galaxies uh, with a lot of dust. They're in the Euler class, and they, and they are producing this large cosmic infrared background. Okay, uh, here's just one example, which I'll, I'll come back to a little bit later. Uh, this is SMM J02399, uh, redshift at 2.8. It's forming on the order of 1,000 uh, star, sun-like stars per year. It's about twice the mass of the Milky Way uh, and about 600 times the luminosity. So this is what we're talking about when I'm talking about extreme galaxies. Okay, so if we have this population of high redshift galaxies that are forming a lot of stars, that must mean you go back in time. Uh, the star formation rate uh, must have been higher in the past, and it is. And so if we look at between uh, you know, a billion years after the Big Bang to seven billion years after the Big Bang, redshifts you know, as low as one, the star formation rate in the universe, has, if you go back in time, has increased by a factor of 10. And so there these with most of the star formation going on in these extreme galaxies. So to under, really to understand what is going on in the evolution, evolution of the universe, why we see this large, high increase of star formation rate, we really need to understand and study these ultra-luminous uh, galaxies in the early universe. And to do that, uh, we can make use of then the extreme emission lines. So specifically the far infrared fine structure lines. So where do they come from? Well, in the star-forming paradigm, they come from star-forming regions. So if we have, uh, in this case, a bunch of gas, and we put a star in the middle of it, it's going to ionize the gas around it and create a stellar H2 region. Uh, and on the border of the stellar H2 region is a photodissociation region where it transitions from ionized gas to atomic gas and then finally to molecular gas. And then spread right out through all this region is going to be some dust. Um, now, Basically what happens is in each of these different regions, based off of the ionizing photons, how much energy they have, will have different ionization species and hence different, uh, different uh, fine structure lines will, will arise. So in the ionized region, we have things like emission from uh, doubly ionized oxygen, singly ionized nitrogen. In the atomic gas, the PDR region, we'll have our very popular C+, the C258 micron line, or oxygen one. And then finally, in the molecular region, we'll have obviously CO, uh, other molecular tracers, and also uh, C1. Uh, as I said, through all of this, there's dust, and that dust is absorbing the far UV photons uh, and re rating it as infrared. But also, those far UV photons uh, are responsible for heating the gas. Some of, some of the far UV photons will eject off electrons uh, from dust grains and go in and, and thermalize and heat the gas in the PDR. Uh, which will then go on and actually excite these fine structure lines. So, so all this emission, the far infrared, the UV, and the fine structure lines are all related. And we can understand how they're all related. So let's look at one of them, specifically the C2 line. 
And basically, if you look at models of these photo dissociation regions, the C2 line, they're basically the ratio of the C2 to the far infrared, which the far infrared really is a measure of, of the total UV emission. Um, depends, this ratio depends both on the density of the gas and in these curves, the strength of the far UV radiation field, where we parameterized it as G, which is the strength of our local uh, interstellar radiation field. Basically, as you increase uh, in far UV field, field strength, the ratio of the C2 to the far infrared goes down. So what really is the C2 line? Just as an example, well, it's actually a transition between the fine structure levels of the electronic ground state, so it's a, it's a forbidden transition. Which means basically if you want to get it into that excited transition and, and produce an emission line to get it there, it needs to be collisionally excited. Um, and that's great for cooling the gas. So you know you have uh, energetic protons or electrons, it comes and hits one of these ionized carbon molecules, will excite it, uh, and then when it falls back down, it will emit it and, and take energy away from the region. Uh, because it's collisionally excited, uh, it depends both on the gas density. Um, and then also always just the gas temperature. So in that case, that gas temperatures depend on the far UV field strength. Uh, and so you get this relation here. Now what's make these extreme is the line ratio. This line, this, the luminosity in this line itself can be huge. Uh, easily spanning anywhere from 0.1 to 1% of the far infrared luminosity. And we'll look, I'll show you what that actually means in, in a second. And the other great thing about these far infrared fine structure lines is in most astrophysical cases, they're optically thin and unaffected by dust absorption. So if they emit the photon, they get collisionally excited and then emit the photon, that energy is gone. It's going to cool and we can sum it up over an entire galaxy. Uh, so it becomes very useful. And because it seems like these, these early galaxies are really, really dusty, um, that means these lines are going to be ideal for studying these high z extreme galaxies. We don't have to worry about the dust content. Okay, so. There's more than just C plus, however. Um, this is kind of a nifty plot. So if you plot the critical density um, versus the ionization potential of the, of the species, um, and then they're color coded basically by the sort of region you would expect to find them in. So uh, these lines you would expect to find in atomic gas, PBRs. This would be stellar H2 regions, uh, uh, H2 region, ionized region around an AGN, and then these are finally stellar coronal lines. But what's nice about this plot uh, is if you pick any two lines and you say, okay, what, what information do I get uh, if I take two lines? Let's say the nitrogen 2, 122 micron, the oxygen 3, 88 micron. Basically, they have the same, very similar critical densities, but very different ionization potential. So we take the ratio of those line fluxes, we're getting a measure of the ionization potential. And there's a whole series of combinations. So first you'll notice that C2 is on here twice, because it can actually arise in also the ionized region. And when it, in the ionized region, its critical density is very similar to nitrogen 2. Uh, so the ratio of this basically directly tells us how much C plus, how much of this uh, C2 emission is coming from an ionized region. Uh, another possibility is if you take oxygen 4, oxygen 352 micron, and oxygen 88 micron, uh, you get the hardness of the, ion, the ionizing radiation fields. Basically, it can determine is the emission being produced by AGN or stars. Uh, and then lastly, another example is uh, this, kind of hard to see, but this three set here, nitrogen 357 micron, oxygen 352, and oxygen 388 micron, that can tell us the basically nitrogen to abundance ratio uh, in, these, in this gas. So there's a lot of, you know, a plethora of, of information you can get out of these various lines, but how is it extreme? Well, to look at that, let's look at one of these, a model SED for one of these galaxies. So this is a computed model SED. But the relative strengths of the continuum and also the lines is based off of, off of actual observations. So they said, okay, we measured the C plus line at certain line flux uh, in certain intensity. We'll put that in there like this. And you look at this and you're like, well, that doesn't seem too extreme. But of course, for clarity, we always like to plot things in log plot. So if we actually plot things in linear, things change a little bit. And now all of a sudden, you see the, the line to continuum ratio is huge. The, the line is quite extreme. And in fact, it would be like if, uh, there we go, if, you know, we took Heidelberg here, uh, which we all stopped at about 130 meters above sea level, uh, and we built the uh, Burj Khalifa 
top building, which is the tallest building in the world at 830 meters. For reference, uh, that would still be the building has about 400 meters above where we are at the Institute. So these lines are insanely, insanely bright. Okay, so uh, the first observations of these, you know, we've known about them for a while. Uh, was actually with the Koiper Airborne Observatory in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and these really made the first important observations uh, of these lines, both in the Milky Way and in local uh, galaxies. So then the next step was uh, in the later 90s, the, the, there was a Firefly Spectroscopy in Space with the Infrared Space Observatory, ISO. Um, and basically, this extended it to a little bit more distant galaxies and also to uh, humans. And one of the key takeaways from these studies was this observed C plus deficit, which is kind of all the rage if you ever observe this line. So basically what they said is we plot the luminosity of the C2 line to the far infrared versus the actual just far infrared luminosity. As a person gets to the higher luminosity, in other words, as a person gets to the Euler class, most of the local Eulers, this ratio falls off. And there are several different possibilities. Is one is these Eulers just maybe have a lot of dust in them, so they have really dusty H2 regions that are absorbing up, sucking up some of the UV photons. The other possibility is that it's just really uh, a measure of how compact the star forming region is. And so, basically this is where we were uh, back with, right around when I started my PhD, um, where we said, you know, we know star formation rates in the universe were much higher, these galaxies were quite dusty, uh, the sun and other galaxies uh, were discovered as this population of high redshift Eulers, and locally the C plus emission falls off at high luminosities. But we also suspect that C plus and other fine structural lines should be very useful uh, for probing the star formation both in local systems and hopefully then also in high Z systems. So this brings us uh, to the work that we did with the first generation Zeus. And what is Zeus 1? Uh, so basically, it's the redshift early universe, early universe spectrometer. Um, the goal was to study the star formation rate of the history of the universe from early times to the current epoch. So it, it's a submillimeter gradient spectrometer. So it's a little bit different. Most people who work in the submillimeter have receivers, they have heterodyne systems. Uh, but this is actually in a shell gradient spectrometer, very similar optics to what you might find in an optical or infrared instrument. Um, so our Grading gives us a resolution, resolving power of about 1,000, so that matches very closely uh, to the line widths of the galaxies that we're going to look at, so the lines will be about 250 to 300 kilometers per second. Um, it allowed, allowed for multiple uh, detections at both 350 and 450 micron uh, windows, so that corresponds to ALMA band 10 and band 9, for those that know about ALMA. Uh, it only had 32 detectors, so basically it would look at one position on the sky, uh, and give 32 uh, resolving elements. And we, to get the simultaneous detection, we split that in half. So we get a 16 element spectra at 350 microns and a 16 element spectra at 450 microns. Uh, it was with liquid helium and a closed cycle uh, helium 3 refrigerator. So the detector operated at about 200 millikelvin. Okay, we observed at the Caltech Sub Millimeter Observatory in Hawaii, um, which is I actually think a pretty extreme environment. I'll show a picture of how extreme it gets later. But Zeus 1 was very, very successful, uh, both locally. So they had the first extra lack detection of 13 CO6 to 5, which now uh, Herschel and Spire has done uh, quite well, um, and, and high five for that matter. And also the first C plus detection uh, for a galaxy between redshift 1 and 2. Uh, there were uh, previous high redshift detections, some folks uh, here, like Fabian was involved in some of the higher redshift detections. But the first in that peak epoch of star formation between redshift 1 and 2 uh, was, was with Zeus 1. And in total now we actually have about 24 detections of the C2 line between Z, Z of 1 and 2. And when we go ahead and put our galaxies now on this plot of the C2 to the far infrared ratio versus far infrared, the picture changes a little bit. So uh, basically the diamonds and the triangles are the Zeus 1 sources, and I've also included other sources from uh, literature. So there's some SMGs between <coughs> 2 and 5, and then some higher redshift quasars above the redshift of 2. And now the color coded green are star formation nominated sources, and pink, magenta, are ones where the AGN, other, other observations tell us the AGN is dominating the energetics of the source. The first takeaway is, once you throw on these high redshift sources, there's no clear deficit. 
there are sources that are extremely bright in the early universe that actually have ratios which are higher than we see nearby in some cases. Um, the other takeaway, which I find interesting, um, and still, there's still a lot of work to be done on that, is there seems to be a loose dichotomy in the higher early universe. That the sources that are uh, dominated by the AGN, the active black nuclei, have lower ratios, where star formation dominated sources have higher ones. Yeah. The, the, the windows green diamonds be dust dominated? And you said earlier that dust domination can kill the local units. Well, <laughs> so yeah, so that's, that's always, there's a lot of uncertainty into what causes this deficit. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly mention that a little bit. But yeah, I mean, so there, there is this issue. Um, I personally do not like the dusty H2 region argument, and I haven't actually seen clear evidence that says, yes, this can explain it. Everybody said, well, it could be this, but I haven't actually seen it. So, I mean, it's a possibility, but um, not like it, in my, in my, in my case. Uh, However, what is more likely, and what we have gone on to explain is, first, there really is no deficit. In certain situations, you can suppress this ratio, uh, but it really depends on the actual, what's going on in the galaxy, not so much that you know, all very luminous systems are going to have, have this suppressed C2 emission relative to the farm grid. But what one way to, to explain what we're seeing here um, is this ratio is just really describing the far UV field intensity, um, so then what that means for a given ratio, the luminosity is indicative of the source size. So basically, uh, in the case of local galaxies, you have not very intense star formation going on, but also not very compact, it's spread out, which is what you would expect in a, in a Milky Way type of galaxy. As you get into the local Eulerts, okay, their luminosity is really high, 10 to 12, but their ratio is also very, very low. So that means their star formation is very intense, but it's in a very compact star forming region on the order of below a kiloparsec, so 200 parsecs. If you look at similar luminosity high redshift sources, they, they have to be going, undergoing a lot of star formation, but to explain this relatively high ratio, that means it's spread out on kiloparsec scales over the entire galaxy. Of course, the one little goofy, interesting thing is, is why then are AGN different? And possibility here is that the star formation is even more intense, so that way the H2 regions are all very close to, to each other. Uh, but again, to account for these much higher uh, far infrared luminosities, it would have to be uh, still extended. So, so basically what it is is this ratio, once one person takes into account the luminosity, might be indicative of the mode of star formation. Is it a cold accretion or is it merger driven um, in, in these systems? And so that's basically where we're at. So low Z Eulers, low Z extreme galaxies have far, high far UV fields, compact, merger driven in the nuclear. High Z is definitely more complex, uh, but in star formation dominated sources, we really say it's kiloparsec scale star formation and possibly accretion driven. So uh, basically what we're saying is in some galaxies, we don't need a major merger to explain these high star formation things. Just the large amount of molecular gas and possible accretion from Cosmic web uh, might be able to explain it. And there are, is some, some modeling that, su that supports this. Uh, yeah? Can you explain why this is related to the size? It's not clear to me why you're assuming, you're saying that one is more complex than the other. Yeah. You this C2 over. Well, so, okay, so it's, for, first we have to, so, oops. So, first, if we, if we basically, if we just look at one far infrared luminosity, okay, so ignore going to higher. For, for right now, uh, basically, you can do a, these, these studies are all basically unresolved, so you can do a geometry argument and get a beam filling factor. And when you do that, and you say, okay, we have this ratio, which we know based off PDR models, this ratio relates to the far UV field strength. But we know that dust is reprocessing the far UV field in the infrared emission. So basically, we have a measure of the infrared emission, and we have a separate measure of the far UV field strength in, basically it's the average far UV field strength in a star forming region. So basically, if we have that, and we have the total emission, we can say what fraction of our beam on the source must be filled with star forming regions to produce the observed far infrared luminosity. And that gives us a, basically a size scale. So if you say all the, so if at far infrared luminosities of 10 to 12 solar luminosities, 
a galaxy here will have a much more compact star forming region. The, the, the fraction of our beam which is filled with star formation is much smaller than a galaxy up here. And the difference is, is this is you know, 100 parsecs, 200 parsecs, and this has to be two or three kiloparsecs. But of course, that would assume a uniform distribution. And you know, so it's basically what it, what it says is it's spread out over the entire galaxy. Uh, now, if you look at then the AGN dominated systems, they have similar ratios to local humans. But now their far infrared luminosity is a factor of 10 higher. So that, what that must mean is that means that the, the, the H2 regions, the UV radiation in the H2 regions, must be similarly intense. The far UV field strength must be really high. Um, but to account for all that luminosity, it has to be, again, a lot more there than what we see in local UV. So the argument is that high Z AGNs are scaled up local Eulers, whereas these guys are scaled up normal guys. Okay, so along with the CO and, and the C2, also detected, which was uh, my work, the oxygen 388 micron line and the nitrogen 2122 micron line in high Z galaxies. Uh, we detected uh, N2 from two galaxies, SMM and the Cloverleaf. I, I talked a little bit about that at a Galaxy Coffee about a month or so ago. Uh, and then we also get the oxygen 3 from this APM source at redshift of almost 4, and also oxygen 3 from SMM. Now this is really exciting because we have both lines in SMM, so that means we can make use of this line ratio to tell us the strength of the ionizing radiation field, or excuse me, the, the uh, basically hard, the hardness, excuse me. But before I do that, uh, just as a quick aside, again, how extreme is this line? Uh, well, basically if you integrate up the line for SMM, it has about 2 times 10 to the 10 solar luminosities which is pretty much equivalent to the power of the entire Milky Way galaxy in one line. Okay, so what happens when you look at the line ratio? Uh, so we have the line ratio of oxygen 3 to far infrared, or excuse me, to nitrogen 2 here. Uh, and if we have in blue, these are uh, stellar H2 region models. And you can see that the line ratio basically only depends on the effective stellar temperature of the ionizing stars. So if you get this line ratio, you can basically, and it's definitely stars that are producing the emission. You can s tell what the effect of stellar temperature is. You can figure out actually how many H2 regions that you might need to produce the lot strength of this line, and how old, on average, how old the starburst is. Of course, these, these lines could also be produced by an AGN in the narrow line region. Uh, so these are Brent Rowe's uh, narrow line region models. Uh, in this case, uh, it relates to the ionization. So unfortunately, there is a degeneracy between the narrow line region and the H2 if we just have these two, two lines. Uh, but uh, it, it, in the H2, this one thing I'm really excited about, we can, like say, we can constrain the most massive stars on the IMF and hence the H of the stars. So what do we do? If, what happens if we do this with SMM? Well, our line ratio is here. Uh, so basically, it could be if we say it's pure AGN, we get an ionization parameter log U of minus 3.5. However, if it's pure star formation, then we basically need uh, to have, on average, the largest star, the 095 stars, ionizing 100 to 400 million H2 regions. So basically, it tells us that the starburst is less than 10 million years old. Of course, you could also have a composite. That works in the model. So just with this line ratio itself, we need more information to really know what's going on, but it's still very useful. And one way to do this is either get additional spectral probes or a higher spatial resolution. So, due to their brightness and the ability to trace the physical conditions of the ISM and star formation, the far infrared fine structure lines could possibly revolutionize, in my opinion, our understanding of early galaxies uh, via large surveys. Specifically, what am I talking about? Uh, well, there's this proposed telescope that they're working hard on to, to build and get funding for. Uh, it's called CCAT. Uh, Cornell, where I was for my PhD, is a big partner in it. It's a 25 meter sub millimeter telescope that is basically going to perform. Uh, Sloan SDSS style surveys, but in the sub millimeter wavelengths. Uh, so that includes photometric and spectroscopic. So it will detect tens to hundreds of thousands of galaxies and hopefully you know, detect these far infrared fine structure lines with them. So we'll have this really strong statistical sample. But that's some interesting potential, but what do we actually have to do to get there? Well, 
Um, there are many unanswered questions. Um, sometimes we like to think, hey, we know everything, but we don't. So one of them is, you know, I had C2 on the one plot in two places. It could come from both ionized or atomic. So we don't really actually have a good handle on saying, in this source, how much of the C plus is coming from ionized gas versus atomic? Uh, what really is causing this deficit? So we, we know in certain situations the C plus line is suppressed. What really is causing it? We still don't know for sure. Um, why is there this dichotomy between NGN and cell formation? Another part one, if we're going to do Salone style that, uh, surveys within some millimeter with these far infrared fine structure lines, we need to know how these foreign structure lines relate to the optical BP diagnostics so we can compare them and have an understanding of the systematics and compare them to local optical systems. And then also, how does resolving the emission change this picture? And of course, uh, Herschel and both Alma are the keys, I think, to realize, one of the keys to realizing this potential, and there's a bunch of folks here I know that are working on, on Herschel data to do just this. Uh, so there's, you know, as part of Herschel, uh, there's a skull survey, uh, Kingfish and Shining, where they're you know, able to resolve, uh, do more resolve studies than what were done with K KAO and ISO in nearby systems. Add in larger samples of ULERDs and LERDs, and then of course connect them to the optical tracers. And very recently, uh, Calvin Grakel had this great paper on the archive where they have resolved uh, emission of the oxygen 163, 88, nitrogen 2, 122, and C2, 158, and also uh, these fantastic integral field unit uh, spectroscopy of the optical tracers. So it's being done, it's very exciting, and uh, yes, we'll learn a lot more. But we need something similar at high Z, I think, to really bookend things and, and to connect them. And we started this with Zeus-1. Uh, we now have about 30 total fine structure lines detected with Zeus-1 above Z of 1. Unfortunately, probably half of these are at high declination, so we can't observe them with Alma, which is sad. Uh, we do have the ones we can observe with Alma. We have programs to try and resolve them. Uh, we followed up before uh, Herschel lost his coolant. We followed up with about 2 thirds. Uh, to get lower wavelength lines, uh, so the lines that we wouldn't, don't fall in, in the, in the Tilleric windows to, to get from the ground. Uh, but many of these have never been resolved, like they have, haven't, you know, they're very optically faint, so the time wasn't put in to get optical morphologies. Um, some of them have archival observations in CO and optical traces, but not all of them. And so one of the things uh, over my uh, next few years while I'm here, uh, is really to leverage uh, resources in MBIA like Bhatia Dabur, VLT, LBT to try and kind of flush out and fill out the, 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 the ancillary data to really make this a good data set. But that's only for the systems, uh, okay? So I should say ALMA now is going to involve the resolve study of these to really understand if we start resolving down to smaller scales, close, you know, to kiloparsec scales, how does that change uh, uh, these observations? Um, but really, you know, if we're going to have ALMA resolve things, uh, one thing I discovered is ALMA is in high demand. If you really want to get ALMA time, you better know what the line flux is ahead of time. And so while we basically have leveraged all the sources we can with ALMA, we really want to go on and get another sample of galaxies uh, that we can then follow up a select number of those with ALMA to get uh, resolved. But it would also be nice that if these sample of galaxies already had all this ancillary data, so we don't have to go in. Uh, so that's one of the things I'll be working on, but really, what's next? Okay, so I already kind of said that. Uh, but really, what's next is, once we've identified the possible sources we want to observe within fine structure lines, what really is next is the extreme technologies and Zeus-2. So Zeus-2, which was most of my thesis work, um, it's almost identical, basically identical goal to Zeus-1 except that we're going to leverage new maturing technologies to maximize the science we can do with it while also reducing the operating costs. Uh, so to do that, we're going to maximize our access to sources, both what telescopes we can go to, which hemisphere we can observe from, uh, maximize the wavelength coverage so we can maximize what redshifts we can look over, and also then for a given galaxy, maximize which uh, lines we can actually observe. And then we'll also maximize the sensitivity as much as possible. To do this, we make use of some new technology, which has some crazy uh, acronyms. So we have transition edge sense bolometers um, that are background limited. They observe between 200 and 850 microns. We're about one and a half times more sensitive than Zeus-1. Instead of just one spatial position on the sky, now we have five to 10. 
and we've increased our uh, instantaneous bandwidth up to 5%. In most configurations, we're about 2.5%. Uh, we switched to a dry cryostat, so we have a refrigerator where I just flip the switch and come back 24 hours later and I'm cold, which is very exciting. Uh, and then we designed it, uh, basically the size and all the, all the other equipment for it, so we could deploy it on really the, the three telescopes that might be useful to us, Apex and Matacama, CSO, I'm on the K of our JCMT. And of course, as some folks know, funding situations with CSO and JCMT are always up in the air. Uh, but we designed it for that anyway. Uh, just as a, as a side, the type of thermometers, the, the detectors that we have, uh, they're the same technology used in the BICEP 2 instrument, which did, may have detected primordial uh, BMO polarization. Um, so, I'll describe a little bit how, the, how this detector technology works, and you might be like, does that really help us explain and believe their result? Because um, the detector's crazy. Okay, so, uh, so here's our, our Madau plot again, so star formation rate versus uh, redshift. These were the two uh, wavelength uh, windows that Zeus-1 could observe at, and so, if we assume the C2, uh, basically the C2 observable redshift for Zeus 1, it's between redshift 1 and 2. If we now add, look at where Zeus 2 is, uh, it means we can go all the way almost from redshift uh, you know, 0.5-ish all the way up to redshift to 5. This is just with the C plus line. If we add in the other fine structure lines, either longer wavelength or shorter wavelength, uh, we can expand that even more. So I mean, right there, the scientific potential is much higher. Uh, and of course, as I said, we designed it for multiple telescopes. So uh, for the CSO, uh, that meant we, in pink here is the envelope, the space that we could use to put the instrument. And at CSO, it was kind of short and fat. Uh, for Apex, it was uh, skinny and tall. And if we wanted to take it to Apex, they had to fit this weird thing. <laughs> of course, basically then the shape of the instrument is if we combine them all together, <laughs> and we get this. Uh, which is basically one B. So it's about uh, one meter tall, half a meter diameter, 130 kilograms. So if I, I fold over, <laughs> it's, it's one, one car. Over. And of course, this does leave room for, for a mounting structure as well. Uh, OK, so what are the optics look like? Well, I said it was an, a, a grading spectrometer. So we have our entrance window. We have uh, a reading imager. And then we have a slit right here. So this is the entrance slit into the spectrometer. It goes down to the, the primary mirror, up to the grating, back down to the primary, and then over to the arrays here. Uh, so it's pretty compact. Like say, I mean, it fits within half a meter to one meter uh, size object. Uh, this is what our grating looks like. So it's about 35 centimeters long. Uh, the rulings are actually, you can see them, but it's actually pretty cool uh, because they're, they're it, when you just look at it, it just looks like a mirror. I mean, you can still see reflections in it like a mirror, so it's pretty cool. Uh, what does the array look like? Well, I said it was, we have three sub-detectors, and so they look like this. Um, so, to our knowledge, this is the first and only sub-millimeter spectrometer that uses these TS barometers. They've been used quite a bit in cameras, like BICEP or SCUBA-2, uh, for instance. Uh, but basically, we have these three arrays. They have different sizes because they're optimized for different wavelengths. So 215 micron, 400 micron, and 645 micron. Uh, we have very high optical efficiency, so we're getting better than 90% absorption in each pixel. Yeah. But on your transit sensor, I think it's a wavelength sensitive detector. These are not wired up that way. Is that correct? It's transition. You know, single photon, you get the spectrum no. information on a single you photon. You do not. That is one way to run a transition edge sensor. Okay. Uh, and these are barometers. These are barometers, yes. Okay. So, yeah, so, so they're transition edge barometers, so I'll talk about that in just a second, what that actually means. But the other key here is within each uh, subband, we get between five and 10 spatial positions on the sky. Now, this weird configuration is actually important to us because it means if we're mapping extended sources uh, nearby, we can actually get simultaneously the N2205, C1609, 13CO605, C1370, and CO76 all at one time. If it's a point source, then we have to choose. We either choose observe over here and get a, observe in the 350 or 450 micron windows, or over here in the 200 micron windows or the long 645 
Um, um, these have this weird cutout simply because the optical quality falls off, and so pixels might be very useful, but it makes the arrays and the wafers stronger if we, if we don't actually have the pixels. So what is a volometer? Uh, the best way I can describe a volometer is it's like a calorimeter, calorimeter that you might use uh, in an early chemistry class. So you have some insulating air cavity with an inner container filled perhaps with water, and if you put a hot piece of metal in there, the water temperature is going to increase. We know what the properties of the water are, uh, and so you can actually then measure how much energy there was in this piece of metal. So the volometers that we work with are very similar. Uh, basically, you have this uh, big block of silicon. You etch out this little tiny guy here. Um, this is our silicon volometer. It's got a couple little isolating legs. There's our thermal bath. We add a transition end sensor, which is actually a superconductor held at a, a specific temperature. Uh, we add an absorber that will absorb photons. And when you shine light on it, it will absorb photons. And this will increase in temperature. And we can measure that change in temperature with the TDS. So this is what one actually looks like. So this is for our, uh, the 400 micron array. So they're about 1.3 millimeters. This is the TDS itself. This grid is the absorber. It's a metal gold, basically gold palladium mesh. Um, and these look, it, where you see black, there is actually silicon there. It's just so thin you can't actually see it. Uh, similarly, so these are the wires that connect to the TDS. And you can kind of see them snaking out uh, because they have to go out to the bath along the legs. So you put a whole bunch of them together, you get an array, you put them all in a detector package, and it looks like this. Uh, so you might be able to see slight little blurry dark spots in the middle. Those are the TDSs again. And now it looks gold because there's actually a reflective uh, backing. So, it's, it's, so that way when a photon comes in, if it's not absorbed right away, it will bounce off and constructively uh, interfere on the bolometer. So we make sure we deposit all the power uh, on the bolometer itself. Okay, what is the TS? Well, I said it's a superconductor. And basically, we're making use of the fact that as you cool down a superconductor, it gets to a point where it has a very, very sharp transition from resistance to superconducting. Uh, so if you can keep it right here on this, this edge, a very small change in temperature or thermal load uh, will cause a relatively large change in resistance. Of course, this is a very tiny resistance. Uh, typically, we, things are not that sort of resistance. Typically, we like resistances in the hundreds of zones, kilo ohms, things like that. So how do we actually read this out? It means we need something with similarly low resistance to read it out. And that brings us to our, our uh, readout system. So we have a bolometer. We attach it to basically a current of, uh, excuse me, a voltage source. And so we run a constant current through a resistor. And we get that. So now if the resistance of our bolometer changes, um, we're going to get a change in current. And we're going to read that change in current out with what's called a SQUID, superconducting quantum interference device. Um, SQUIDs are very sensitive magnetometers, very sensitive to magnetic fields, so sensitive that even just Earth's magnetic field is too strong. They will not work in Earth's magnetic field. Um, so we convert this change in current from the bolometer into a magnetic field with an inductor. Uh, so we have this I out, converts to a magnetic field which is picked up by the squid, which then produces a change in voltage. Um, so problem, one problem, though, with the squids is they are nonlinear. They actually produce sinusoidal responses uh, to changing the magnetic flux. So we actually have to counteract that. And so we actually have this active feedback system. So if we get a little change in current here, we put in an equal amount of current in this coil to cancel out any change. Um, so it's, it's a fairly complex system, but it works. Okay, this is what one of the whole detectors look like. There's the detector. This is the whole readout. Uh, or excuse, this is a big piece of silicon, because we need uh, superconducting lines from the detector over to our squids, which are here. So these are our squid readout. And then there's just a standard PCB board, which goes out uh, to the rest of the readout electronics. Okay, so I'm really short on time here, so let me skip ahead a little bit. Um, so basically, um, we have DUCE 2. We built it. And then last November 2012, so about a year and a half ago now, we went and observed on Apex, uh, which is in the Atacama Desert in 
It is an extreme location, about 5,000 meters, and has really excellent precipital water vapor. For those that don't know, Apex is essentially a test telescope for ALMA, very identical in many regards to some of the, some of the ALMA telescopes. Um, and if you ever have a reason to observe in the millimeter or submillimeter, I highly recommend putting in proposal in the Apex because it's a great place to observe. Sometimes you get to have barbecues on Friday while observing. Uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, we were successful in, in with SIS2 and getting our first detection. It was a very challenging observing round. This is the first time we'd ever been to Apex. We had very used to CSO, and whenever you go to a new telescope, it can be very challenging. But ultimately, we were, we were, very, we were successful and got our first detection of a uh, C-plus line from a Redshift 1.8 galaxy. This is a, a highly lensed Herschel source, um, and it's reported in a paper that came out in Katie. Okay, so wrapping things up, summary now. Um, extreme galaxy, like Euler's, um, I think are very interesting and important phase of galaxy evolution in the universe. Um, we can observe them and understand them through their extreme emission lines, like the far infrared uh, fine structure lines that allow us to understand the physical conditions in these galaxies. Um, and we can do that, make these observations by leveraging extreme technologies uh, and locations, which I didn't talk about. Um, so what is the outlook? Well, uh, now that I'm done with my PhD and here at MPA, basically one of my goals is to really obtain this ancillary data for our existing Zeus-1 galaxies, identify a new sample of galaxies for Zeus-2, um, and then obviously go on an observing run. We actually have an observing run uh, with Zeus-2 on Apex this August, September. We don't know the exact date yet. And there's a possibility that we may go back to the CSO at least one time to try and go after some northern hemisphere sources uh, that we couldn't get from the US. Uh, Zeus 2 is a PI instrument, uh, but we would like to make it as available as possible, and so we are tentatively planning on making Zeus 2 available to the community, maybe possibly uh, in a per, uh, ESO proposal deadline uh, next year. In the meantime, though, if you have an interesting source, definitely talk to me. Uh, we're always interested in a you know, target of opportunity sort of situation. If you have a really interesting source, that would be uh, useful for observing. To do that, though, of course, uh, how sensitive is this? Uh, so, just real quickly, this is the minimum detectable line flux of a line uh, in watts per meter squared. We can expect to detect this is two in black, so we've accounted for atmospheric absorption here. Uh, and then down here, we plotted the uh, far infrared luminosity of the galaxy if we assume typical C2 to far infrared ratios. Uh, so, basically, in our primary bands, we're we're in the, you know, 5 times 10 to the minus 19 to, um, I guess that's like 7 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, watts per meter squared. This is in uh, uh, 5 sigma detection in 4 hours of observation. For comparison, we also have uh, the sensitivity of the Herschel Pax, uh, Spire, and Hi-Fi, so we're, you know, which of course isn't so applicable anymore because you can't observe with Herschel anymore, but there's still a lot of Herschel data, but for comparison, this is how much more sensitive we are. And then I've also included on here, which might be a little silly, uh, the ALMA 12 meter, so that when ALMA is fully in its final configuration, the sensitivity of its 12 meter array, and then the total power array. And so you can actually see we're comparable to the total power, which basically means the total power is four apex-like antennas. So basically it means that on a per antenna basis, we're four times more sensitive than, than ALMA. But when you combine all the all the ALMA dishes, ALMA is about a factor of 30 to 40 times more sensitive. That sounds like, whoa, we don't want to do that, but actually it's, it's useful. So if you're interested in Milichanskis in our primary 350, 450 micron beams, this is the one sigma, one hour RMS. But what this means for ALMA is any line we detect with Zeus 2, we can map that same emission with 30 to 40 beams over the source in the exact same amount of integration time. So it actually is quite nice. And 30, you know, 30 to 40 beams across the source is, is pretty reasonable. Um, so with that, thank you. I will take questions.
So at the beginning, you showed the model plot with the uh, INC uh, stock information rate. Yes. And you made the point that if you want to understand that, we have to understand this uh, extreme object. Is that really true? Because I would argue that most of the stock information comes every time from normal objects and not from this 200, 1,000 solar masses per year. So my understanding is, is in and maybe some recent work for school two, I, I don't, I don't know. But my understanding is, it's still true that as you go to high redshift, the bulk of the star formation is, I should say, isn't in UERBs, it's in LERBs. But LERB is still extreme. You know, we're still talking, and LERB is in the range that we can do with these two. The factor of 1.5 better sensitivity means we can push that luminosity down. And especially if you go after lens sources, then you can really push, push down the luminosity function. But yeah, so. You know, you, is alert an extreme source? Well, I would say it's extreme. Maybe it's not as bright in total luminosity, but most of the emission is still coming out from the far infrared. So that seems extreme in my opinion. So. Yeah, so I'm going to go to just my ignorance. So you have an instrument you can put a telescope. You can take it down and put another telescope. Yes. The question is, do we really want to do yeah, that? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, all my, all my knowledge about instrument comes from when I was yeah. in a bit like Tom, where people would say, oh, we put the instrument in the telescope, and that takes a lot of time to be uh, calibrated. So, how, how efficient is this so, strategy, or is that your particular instrument? Well, so basically, it's so in the case of Zeus 2, really, it's kind of a political reason, right? Cornell does not have a submillimeter telescope that they can call it our own, that we guarantee we have telescope time. So by making it available and designing it so we can take it anywhere, it ensures the widest possibility that we're going to get time on a telescope somewhere to do this work. The other thing is, it, is we have optimized it a lot to make it very easy to put on a telescope and take off. Basically, once it's out of the boxes, uh, in three days, we can be on the telescope and ready to align. So, I mean, that, and that's, that's really, in the most cases, just the time it takes to cool down. So, it's while it's cooling down, we're setting up the mount on the telescope, and then it's cold, we put it on. Uh, so, so we have optimized it a lot in that sense. Uh, the question is, of moving it to another telescope is shipping it. It's a pain in the ass, and you risk damaging it. So, um, you know, we have you could do it a situation where. We spend the good observing, so we basically spend you know northern hemisphere summer in apex in the south pole or the uh, Atacama, and then in northern hemisphere winter when it's good observing at CSO, we, we bring it there. Um, long term, is do we really want to do that? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> but there, like I said, we do have sources that. We would like to follow up on that we observe as Zeus One and other sources that are really interesting that you can't do from the southern hemisphere. So at least one observing campaign to CSO would be would would happen. We think, yeah. the, so the other thing that I, I wasn't able to mention this is if we want to do the short wavelength, so the 200, 215, 230 micron windows, we have to do the impact. CSO doesn't have good enough weather. But on, the other way around that is, and for the foreseeable future, Zeus Two will be the only instrument able to do those wavelengths. Um, we're not aware of any plans to do a, you know, some other instrument. I, I should say other than Sophia, but Sophia, you're not going to be able to do high redshift sources. Well, so, okay. uh, thanks, Andrea, for raising instrumentation. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any troubles bringing these detectors out of the country? No. Well, we haven't yet. <laughs> uh, so we had. So I, mean, I can imagine some of these are. Oh, uh, restricted technology. Restricted technology. Um, well, so the 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 one from Zeus one was from Goddard. Uh, the one from uh, Zeus two is NIST. And no, it's not. As far as we know, it's not restricted. Um, we haven't had haven't had any problem. Um, there, it's interesting. The group that we got our detect get our detectors from work with to produce our detectors. They do. They are on a. They want a government uh, grant to produce what they call like terahertz camera, which is you know so like there's this, the body scanners at airports where it's not the X-ray ones, it's the one where you stand in a right. tube in it. Yeah. Well, those are actually millimeter wave, and they want to make one that is a camera that they can just look over a, cl a crowd and see everybody without clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> they have money for that. Um, 
So is there a plan to do kind of a blind C2 survey with this? I mean, do you have, I mean, you were doing four or five hours for your study. Well, you got to your point source of working over there. So, yeah, so, so I didn't say it. So basically all our existing sources we've done so far are what my advisor would like to say, low-hanging fruit. The things that are really bright, we're expecting to detect. And, you know, to prove it works, that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, so that is one thing, uh, not necessarily a blind because, I mean, we're to the point where we prove it works. Uh, we do obviously need, we should get non-detection sometime. Basically, we, we only have a couple non-detections. Uh, and we think if we just, basically, we, we've never observed, integrated on a source more than like three hours. I'm thinking more of, you know, biases in the C2 to IR ratio, right? Because you're going after sources that are detected in a continuum. Exactly. That's yeah. So, um, so to get around that, what I would like, you know, my vision for kind of a, the next generation survey, the Zeus 2 survey, is again to pick targeted sources, but something along the lines of, of Kingfish, so that we were purposely picking a range of foreign thread luminosities that have this follow up data. Um, I mean, I think a blind survey, I mean, it's a possibility, um, but we basically, if you want, to be honest with you, if you want to do a blind survey, you would be better off going to the or waiting for CCAT. And that's essentially what's, I mean, at a certain level, that's kind of what CCAT is going to really be good at, is just do large sky surveys, identify, you know, there'll be some cut for which of these galaxies are going to follow up with spectroscopy, um, just like SDSS, and then, and then hit those. Um, right. Any more questions? Oh, that's not the case. Thanks again.